Okay, hello MS2s. Welcome back to another session. This is session two of clinical ultrasound in your second year. This time we're going to be talking about fever evaluation and we're trying to coordinate the curriculum in the ultrasound as close as we can with your other curriculum. And so since right now you guys are focused on fevers, infections, I thought I would go through with the approach to a patient who has a fever using ultrasound. And I found an article on this and it's uh, it's in German, <laughs> but it's kind of interesting. What they did was basically they took 200 patients with fever and they evaluated them using ultrasound and what they called the area of the collar, thoracal, cardial, abdominal, and small parts. And uh, basically they found out of these 200 patients, 57% of the time they were able to find the source using ultrasound and 12% of the time the ultrasound detected an unexpected source they weren't even considering in the workup of their patients. So to expand on this, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and walk through this stuff. And this is a, a diagram from their article that I, I have here for you. Basically, um, looks like, I don't speak German, but it looks like, you know, you could go to the head or neck uh, in about 12% of patients. And then they found the evidence in 26% of patients in the chest or heart, uh, longer heart, and then down here in the extremities about um, f it looks like 4.5% uh, of patients and then almost half the patients they found the information in the abdomen and 15% of the patients had this. I have no idea what this means but um, yeah. So we're going to go through the head and neck, the lung, cardiac, extremities, and abdomen searching for a fever. So we'll start at the head and this is an example here of a mybobian I should say mybobian uh, gland abscess. Uh, the mybobian glands, or sometimes called tarsal glands, are a special kind of sebaceous gland along the rim of the uh, eyelids inside the tarsal plate. And they make this stuff called mebum, which is an oily substance that prevents evaporation of the eye's tear film. They prevent tear spillage onto the cheek, and it traps the tears between the oiled edge and the eyeball and make the closed uh, eyelids airtight. There's about 50 of these glands in the upper eyelids and 25 in the lower eyelids. They're named after Heinrich uh, Miebum, um, a German physician back in the 1600s. So anyways, um, this patient has a very, very small um, mybomian gland abscess. This is actually their, their eyelid up here coming along right here, and uh, that's the my bomian gland uh, right there. And um, normally you can't see that gland with ultrasound, but this patient had a very swollen eyelid and you can make out a small amount of abscess material, uh, a little pus right in there. This abscess successfully underwent a quick lancing procedure to facilitate pus drainage. Here's another example of where we can use ultrasound on the face. This is a facial abscess scene right here. We see this hypochoic debris here and this ultrasound over here demonstrates how close the facial artery is to this abscess and uh, one of the things we worry about here when whenever we drain an abscess these are arterial waveforms we worry about um, draining an abscess anywhere in the body is accidentally striking an artery so ultrasound helps guide um, the scalpel uh, into the abscess and away from vascular structures uh, such as the facial artery seen here In this case, we have some preauricular uh, lymphadenopathy seen at the um, top of the screen. Uh, so the, um, the auricular uh, lymph nodes can um, be inflamed in various abscess, I mean, uh, various um, viral conditions. One of the most common ones we think of, uh, but it's very rare, is mumps, uh, although a lot of people now are questioning the use of immunizations and so they um, we end up seeing a resurgence in mumps uh, this patient didn't have mumps but it's just uh, interesting to note these are the lymph nodes we see there's about three uh, preauricular uh, deep uh, lymph nodes um, they number from one to three and they lie uh, right in front of the tragus of the ear their afferent uh, their afferents drain the lateral surface of the auricula and the skin of the adjacent part of the temporal region and their efferents pass to the superior deep cervical glands. 
This is another example here of just lymphadenitis. The patient came in with a lot of uh, swelling under their neck, uh, I should say under their submandibular area, and we saw this very prominent uh, lymphadenitis going on here. You wonder sometimes what that swelling is due to. Obviously, many times it's to a lymph node, but it may also be other structures like a thyroglossal duct cyst or, uh, or even an abscess. But this is clearly uh, lymph, lymphadenitis, uh, which is an inflamed uh, lymph node. Another example here of some submandibular lymphadenopathy. Uh, we can see just enlarged uh, lymph nodes here. Not very tender to the touch, interestingly. When you have lymphadenitis, it's a very tender process or infected uh, lymph node. Another place you can get abscesses um, in the head and neck area is near the tonsil. And uh, when you have an abscess uh, adjacent to the tonsil, we call that a peritonsillar abscess. On the physical exam, you open the patient's mouth, you look in the back of the throat, and you see sometimes a deviated uvula, though sometimes you do not. Sometimes you just see a big swollen you know, throat. And so um, while you can definitely identify these structures on CT scans to avoid the, the unnecessary radiation, many times you can use uh, ultrasound using the endo cavitary probe. Here we're using the endocavitary probe on this patient, um, this 12-year-old male, being careful not to call it the other name, which is the endovaginal transducer. If you call it that, they will um, rightfully spit the probe out. So you have to be careful how you, you discuss this with the patient. I, there's really no good name for it. I just call it the ultrasound probe. Any other word sounds sort of suspicious. It's good to cover it with a sheath um, because of the other locations that the transducer can be. It's good to keep it as clean as possible using the sheath. It's good to put gel between the probe and the sheath. You could put a little um, gel in this um, in the sheath and then put the transducer into the sheath so the trans so there's gel between the probe and the sheath. You could spray the patient the back of the patient's throat with um, an analgesic spray um, like a benzocaine or hurricane spray and uh, a little um, verse said to calm the patient's nerves as you're doing this and this is what a peritonsillar abscess looks like here this is the endovaginal or endocavitary probes footprint back here the needle was actually guided in directly into the abscess this hypochoic area here is the abscess so another example here sometimes you're not sure if it's an abscess it turns out this is just lymph nodes these are prominent lymph nodes now as the patient swallows you can many times see these lymph nodes uh, come closer together as they're uh, swallowing here, sometimes they, you'll actually visualize the lymph nodes moving towards each other. They kind of did it right there. So these are not abscesses. These are bilateral prominent uh, lymph nodes. You wouldn't want to put a needle in those. It wouldn't be necessary. Um, and uh, you can avoid doing an unnecessary uh, procedure here once you see that pharyngeal um, adenopathy going on in the back of the throat. To confirm this is a lymph node, lymph nodes can be quite... Uh, vascular, uh, and this is just a hyperemic lymph node seen here with the power flow Doppler confirming it's a lymph node and not an abscess. An abscess would not light up with power Doppler. Um, another thing that people get are that can cause a fever is uh, meningitis. Now, uh, luckily due to a lot of the immunizations, meningitis is uh, quite rare nowadays, uh, but we still uh, need to rule it out uh, from time to time. and. Um, in some patients, it can be difficult to guide the needle where it needs to go. When you perform uh, a lumbar puncture to obtain a sample of cerebral spinal fluid and send it off to the lab to check for meningitis, sometimes it's difficult in larger patients. It's, find, it's difficult to find the landmarks. You end up um, jamming the needle into these uh, bones. These are the transverse processes here of the vertebral bodies. Underneath the transverse process lies uh, the vertebral body. And so the idea is to get the needle uh, in between the interspinous space. And sometimes it's difficult to do that. And what can help is using ultrasound, not real-time guidance, not watching the needle go in between the space under ultrasound real-time guidance. That's actually much more uh, difficult, if not impossible. But what you do is you can um, use ultrasound to outline the landmarks of the transverse processes and then guide the needle between uh, the landmarks uh, into an X placed on the skin. And uh, uh, my fellow from last year, Connie Chan, who many of you uh, obviously know and remember, she created a, a nice video on how to do this. And these are the 
vertebral spinous processes as seen here. The purpose of this video is to demonstrate how to use ultrasound to find landmarks prior to lumbar puncture. After viewing this video, you will have a chance to practice this in a hands-on session. Before you start, make sure your LP tray is ready to go, because once you find your interspinous space using ultrasound, you want to be able to start your LP right away. The first thing you should do is position the patient for an LP, whether in the sitting position or in a lateral decubitus position, whichever is more comfortable for you. Start with the linear probe, or the L38. You may find that in a more obese patient that you'll have to move the curvilinear probe if you can't see what you need to see. Now, identify Tufier's line. This is the horizontal line between the superior iliac crests. This will help you identify the spot where you should first place your probe to look for the spinous processes. Next, you are going to place the ultrasound probe along this Tufier's line in a transverse plane. In this orientation, you are going to keep the ultrasound probe marker to your left and to the patient's left. Now you need to find the spinous process and center it in the middle of the screen. This will appear as a hyperechoic rim with shadowing behind it. You may need to make some small adjustments up and down and side to side with the probe in order to get this image centered in the middle of the screen. Once you have found the spinous process and centered it in the middle of the ultrasound screen, then you are going to make two skin marks on the patient's back. You are going to place these marks right in the middle of the probe on either side. When the probe is removed from the patient's back, these two marks tell you where midline is. Now, place the ultrasound probe in the sagittal plane along midline, which is the marks that you just made. Identify the dorsal spinous processes of the superior and inferior vertebra. Now center the intervertebral space in the middle of the ultrasound screen. Once you have an appropriate image, you are now going to mark the skin on either side of the probe again, as you did before. Again, these marks should be right in the middle of the ultrasound probe on either side of the probe. When you remove the probe, these lines will now indicate where the intervertebral space is. Now when you remove the probe, your hash marks will form crosshairs. The middle of these crosshairs is where you should puncture the skin for your LP, as this corresponds to midline at the intervertebral space. You may find that your hash marks may be removed when you sterilize the patient's back. So before you actually apply betadine to the patient's back, use a pen or a needle cap to make a skin impression. Now you are ready to do your LP. Okay. Now we're going to move on and talk about uh, infections in the chest. And recall that there's something called an A-line. An A-line is just that horizontal repetitive reverberation artifact that originates from the visceral parietal pleural interface. Um, and that's what we see here. So this is the skin line here. And we see the, the interface of the visceral and the parietal pleura coming together here, or the pleural line. and then. At equidistant intervals, we can see an A-line coming down. So in other words, the distance between the chest wall and the VPPI should equal the distance between the VPPI and the first A-line. And A-line just means, think about it like a air, it's an air artifact. And we see this with, uh, with normal lungs. We can also see it in patients who have a pneumothorax. But that's the idea. We, we want to differentiate what normal is from abnormal. And so those, again, those, um, they repeat at, um, in multiples as you go into uh, the chest. You'll see those repeating A-lines coming down. And because we know that air is not a good transducer of sound, sound waves get scattered at the air plural interface. Uh, and that's what we're seeing there. The, the uh, sound is coming in. It reflects off the pleura, comes back again. And then there's this repeating, basically it's an artifact that extends down 
at repeating intervals from the pleural line and into the body. That's because some of the ways the sound waves are reverberating uh, back and forth again, and we get these equidistant parallel bright lines coming down, or A lines. So there's the pleural line, and then there's the first A line, and then there's the second A line. And they, again, they repeat at this equidistant interval. And that's normal. That's what we expect to see uh, in normal lung, although sometimes you can see this with pneumothorax. But what we're talking about right now is uh, infection or pneumonia. And so it's when you lose those A lines, there's absence of A lines, that there's something that's changed in the lung that replaces the air with some kind of substance, whether it's fluid or um, infection, that can uh, transmit sound waves. So uh, just recall the eight probe positions are going to place the, um, the transducer to assess for um, lung pathology. And by eight, I mean four on one side of the chest, and then this will repeat itself uh, on the other side of the chest. And so if we're looking for um, consolidations for pneumonia, that's the other word for pneumonia, consolidation, then it's really these posterior lateral zones. The anterior zone is where the pneumothorax was better seen. So it's these zones back here that we're really going to be focused on looking for uh, consolidations. And a consolidation or pneumonia can be seen on ultrasound up to 90% of cases. And what you see is this uh, hypochoic area in the chest um, that we can see numerous um, horizontal lines, these hyperchoic horizontal lines seen uh, throughout. And actually when you look at this, it really does look like the liver. And the term we use sometimes with ultrasound is, in terms of pneumonia, is there's been hepatitization of the lung. And, um, and that's, that's really the, um, the deal here with pneumonia. You can see the difference between the normal lung with these repeating A lines coming down from the pleural line, uh, caused by the sound air interface at this pleural line. So we can see this artifact here, or we lose the artifact, and we see a consolidation or hepatitization of the lung. And sometimes you get fluid bronchograms. Now these are uh, hypochoic consolidations, uh, basically, with uh, numerous small hyperechoic um, structures on the edges of them, and there's sometimes you'll see like a little blurring of the margin. But these fluid bronchograms are seen within the lung parenchyma in patients who have a consolidation. This is a patient uh, that had pneumonia recently uh, in the hospital. I was doing rounds with the third year medical students uh, maybe a month ago, and we came across a patient with uh, pneumonia, and I actually scanned the patient from their entire posterior of the back. They were, the guy was sitting up, and so um, I didn't want to disturb him too much and have him lay flat and look at his um, coronal views or lateral views. So what I did was I just plopped the probe on his back, and I was able to see um, this, this looks a lot like liver, but actually this was his lung. He had a consolidation here. And in fact, the structure that you see right here is his uh, descending uh, aorta in his chest, which we don't normally see with ultrasound, but because he had this consolidation going on that transmitted the sound all the way to his uh, uh, aorta. So this is actually posterior because I'm scanning from his back, and this is anterior towards his mediastinum, and this is his uh, descending aorta. We can actually see his heart beating sometimes here as well. But this is a great example of consolidation. Now moving on to another cause of uh, fever uh, in a patient could be endocarditis, where one of their valves actually gets infected. This is um, most commonly from using IV drugs, where a bacteria can get gets in the blood, makes its way to the um, right or even left heart, and most commonly, though, it's a tricuspid valve, but occasionally we can see it on the mitral valve. And this is a case here of a mitral valve uh, with the vegetation on it. We can see this vegetation right here. Um, it's attached uh, to the mitral valve, and this is the apical four-chambered view in a patient who has endocarditis. 
This isn't the greatest example, I know. It's kind of hard to see, but this is the, uh, the only one that I have. Now, moving to the extremities, um, we can use ultrasound to differentiate between abscesses and cellulitis quite easily, and the patient who's got a fever or infection. And um, a study that we did uh, here at UCI a number of years ago uh, that we had published with 107 patients, we asked the doctors to look at the skin and say, hey, do you think you see an abscess there, or do you think it's just cellulitis or infection of the skin without an abscess? Because there's a big difference here, because if the patient has an abscess and you don't uh, perform a surgical incision and drainage, then the abscess will not go away. It'll get worse. So abscesses have to be drained surgically, whereas cellulitis can just be treated with antibiotics without any procedure. So it turns out that just using the clinical exam alone, um, the physicians were 86% sensitive and 70% specific, but when they used the ultrasound machine, they were much better uh, at dis distinguishing abscesses from cellulitis. In fact, there was 18 cases in which the ultrasound disagreed with the clinical exam, but the ultrasound is right in 17 of the 18 cases for a significant p-value. So normal soft tissue kind of looks like this. We see skin line here, subcutaneous fat, and this is a fascial plane seen here, and some more soft tissue, um, and here's some bony structure here. This looks like a tendon coming across here. Now, with cellulitis, what we see is cobblestoning. We see these hyperechoic uh, regions in the subcutaneous soft tissue, uh, and sometimes there's some edema. This is what this anechoic material is outlining these different cobblestones, some edema. But notice there's no abscess here. If I go back to this patient, this is a patient well-known to the emergency department, real nice guy comes in uh, who's an IV drug user who gets uh, these abscesses all the time. He showed me his arm and said, look, doc, I have an abscess right here. And you could see all this, some of my other work over here, draining his previous abscesses. But here he says he's got an abscess, and he's usually right. And I put the probe on his arm, and all I saw was this, cobblestoning. He had a lot of induration there, or thickening, or firm skin, but uh, didn't have uh, evidence on ultrasound of, of an abscess. Instead, um, he had cobblestoning. This is another example here of cobblestoning. You only need to treat with antibiotics. There's no reason to stick a needle in this uh, patient here. Just This is just straight up cellulitis. This is an abscess. We can see this hypochoic uh, debris. Uh, we can see it kind of layering out. This is what pus looks like. If we compress this area, which causes some discomfort to the patient, we'll actually see this hypochoic debris swirling around. This is another example here. When we compress, we can see this swirling hypochoic debris. Sometimes we can see it connecting with various other abscesses, and occasionally these abscesses are so large we can't drain them um, at the bedside. They require uh, drainage in the operating room where the patient is under um, full anesthesia because uh, it's just too, too uncomfortable sometimes to drain these uh, at the bedside percutaneously. Here's another example here of an abscess in this uh, subcutaneous soft tissue. Um, we can see once we line it up here, uh, we're looking for it here as we see this debris here. And so many times you see sort of some cobblestoning, but then underneath it you'll see abscess, and other times you'll just see abscess without any subcutaneous soft tissue cobblestoning. Lots of examples of these. These come in all the time. Uh, we can see another example here of abscess material in that uh, superficial soft tissue. Um, here's another example here. We see uh, multiple abscesses here, and underneath it is a very large uh, vascular structure, uh, that we um, art arterial and a venous structure that we do not want to accidentally um, strike with our needle or our scalpel. And so another way that ultrasound helps us to avoid hitting vascular structures when we're doing uh, abscess drainage. Um, this was a very interesting patient I had recently who came in complaining of severe um, sort of pain in his gluteal, superior gluteal fold, uh, or, you know, at the top of his butt cheeks, basically. We used the linear transducer, and all we saw was kind of nonspecific, you know, anechoic dropout here. We don't see any material here at all. Um, he's quite a large person, and so I switched it up to the C60 or lower frequency transducer, and I was able to see this hypochoic material 
uh, that was much deeper to the skin line. We see it here. This is all this hypochoic abscess material that I saw in his um, superior gluteal fold. And it turned out it was a very large abscess that um, went to surgery to have this uh, area drained. Interestingly, on the skin line, there was no evidence of any cobblestoning or cellulitis at all. Just normal sort of soft tissue here. No evidence of cobblestoning. His skin wasn't even red. He just complained of severe low back pain. In fact, the, uh, the resident taking care of the patient ordered some x-rays, which were negative. They didn't see any evidence of abscess on the x-rays, which you wouldn't expect to. The bones looked okay. But it wasn't until we did this ultrasound that we saw he had this severe abscess there. Now here's a, a finger abscess. This is um, the bone of the finger um, seen right here. And superior to the bone or anterior to it, we can see all this abscess material that's beneath the skin but above the bone. This patient had a very large uh, finger abscess that we were able to drain successfully. Um, and you can actually also see something called tenosynovitis, which is an infection of the tendon sheath. And patients have a swollen digit. They have a lot of tenderness to palpation um, when you just push on it. And then when you try to range their finger, moving that tendon sheath through that infected uh, area causes a lot of pain. Um, and so it's often a clinical diagnosis, but it helps sometimes to use ultrasound to differentiate tenosynovitis from just simple cellulitis. And um, what you see on ultrasound is thickening of the tendon sheath, and many times you see an effusion or fluid there. So this is a patient here who's got tenosynovitis of their wrist. This is the tendon, and between the tendon and the tendon sheath, we see some fluid there. And when you see fluid like that, um, it confirms that there's thickening there of that tendon sheath, and there's been this uh, effusion or fluid collection there. And this was a very easy way to confirm uh, the diagnosis of tenosynovitis and differentiate it from cellulitis. We show this image to our surgical colleagues and um, they uh, took the patient for a washout of that, uh, of that tendon sheath. This is a patient who's got a finger in a, in a water bath, um, meaning we dunked the hand in the water bath and we can see at the tip of their finger uh, they have an abscess uh, right here. And um, sometimes it helps to use a water bath to stand away a little bit from the when, when tissue is very uh, superficial. This is the uh, pad here of the finger and um, the palmar aspect of the finger. We can see this abscess here. The fingernail is actually seen right there. And um, we eventually inserted a scalpel into this area and drained uh, out that abscess. Here's another example of uh, paronychia or infection um, in the finger that's just adjacent to the fingernail itself and on ultrasound there's a lot of swelling here of this of this finger and we can see as we're going through this that was actually the fingernail that was coming through there with the abscess uh, adjacent to it. Now moving on to the abdomen there's lots of ways we can diagnose infection in the abdomen I'm going to start here with the, uh, the genital urinary system, and we're going to talk about the kidney. Now, pyelonephritis, this is the kidney here. You're used to seeing it much less echogenic, but this is what a kidney looks like when it's infected or has pyelonephritis, which is normally a very clinical diagnosis. You know, you pound on the patient's back. They've got some CVA tenderness. Pyelonephritis um, is diagnosed with that and an infected uh, urine specimen. But here we see um, a kidney on ultrasound that looks very hyperechoic. Um, and we see this commonly. Remember the, the cobblestoning that you saw a few slides back? The tissue looked very hyperechoic, very bright there. And that happens when you have infection. Things get more echo bright or more hyperechoic. You can also see an abscess in the kidney. This is a renal abscess. The normal renal parenchyma is seen down here. And when you get to the lower pole of the kidney, it's got this very large hypochoic region in here. I agree it's a little difficult to see. I would turn up the gain on this patient. This is the liver seen here, so this must be the right kidney. They go into the short axis, and we can see this area here that looks very hypochoic. It's within the renal, uh, lower renal pole, and this is what a renal abscess looks like on ultrasound. You can also make a diagnosis of a bladder infection or confirm the diagnosis. Again, usually a very clinical diagnosis, uh, but sometimes the patient can't talk to you or they're too young or they're intubated and you're wondering why they have a fever 
and you can look as you're doing your fever survey with ultrasound you can come down to the bladder and you'll see a thickened bladder wall sometimes you'll see some echogenic debris within the lumen of the bladder or even a bladder stone sometimes you can make out a, an ultrasound actually quite easily in a large prostate um, and the patient can have a um, urinary retention or a high post void residual which can actually lead to um, having chronic echogenic debris which form calculi and infections in the bladder. This is in a child we see a very thickened bladder wall. Uh, usually the bladder wall is a few millimeters but here we can see it's um, it looks like it's about a centimeter in thickness which is abnormal. Um, all throughout concentrically this bladder wall is quite thickened in this patient with cystitis. We can also look down in the nether regions, down in the testicles and the uh, epididymis. We can see um, infections down there. And because these are inflammatory processes, uh, structures tend to be enlarged and hyperchoic on the grayscale alone, which can sometimes be difficult to differentiate them from torsion or twisting of the uh, structure on its own blood supply. Later in the year, we're going to talk a lot more about torsion, but for now, we're focused on the the uh, infection or hyperemia. And the, uh, the itis you see here in the word uh, is uh, uh, symbolic for infection. And you can have an infection in the epididymis or the testicle or chitis or both. It usually starts in the epididymis, so you get epididymitis. And then if it goes untreated, extends into the testicle and you get a combined epididymo or chitis picture. That's what we're seeing here. This is the head of the epididymis seen above the testicle or superior to it and we put power flow on it's very hyperemic lights up like a Christmas tree this is a uh, in, an example here of epididymo orchitis that the testicle itself is also very hyperemic we'd go down here to the tail of the epididymis remember the epididymis has a head body and tail in this case we're seeing again orchitis and uh, epididymitis as well And you can see abscesses within the testicle itself or adjacent to the testicle in the scrotum. So that's another way we can use ultrasound to differentiate uh, an infection, the location of the infection, and all abscesses must be drained surgically. This is an abscess down the perineal region. Um, and we can see just this hypochoic material seen like we see anywhere else. But because it's next to the, um, the genital, the uh, scrotal area, we can see that um, quite well here. Uh, just by placing the transducer down in that region, we can see this hypochoic debris. Now, the rest of the abdomen, we can see infections such as cholecystitis or an infect in, infection in the gallbladder. The gallbladder normally has a wall that is less than three millimeters. We measure it on the anterior surface or closest to the skin line in the gallbladder. Now, when we have um, infection in the gallbladder or cholecystitis, that gallbladder wall becomes quite thickened. Here we can see these being one centimeter hash marks. This is definitely a lot more than uh, three millimeters. We can see it's very edematous. We can see the edema in that gallbladder wall. We can see gallstones causing shadowing here. And this is just a case of acute cholecystitis. Here's another example. This is the lumen of the gallbladder, and we can see there is a stone here a minute ago as we fan through it. And this is the wall of the gallbladder, very, very thickened. Uh, this is probably the coolest gallbladder that I have in my collection, I would say. Uh, it's extremely thickened uh, gallbladder wall. Here, the stone is seen here with its shadowing. And we're just kind of fanning through now in a short axis at that incredibly thickened gallbladder wall. This is a very thickened gallbladder wall. We see an echogenic stone with its shadowing, and we also see some pericholecystic fluid. Pretty rare to see this, but when we do, it's pretty exciting. A wedge of fluid seen adjacent to the gallbladder. And all of these findings together, gallstones, pericholecystic fluid, thick wall, and as you lean in on the patient's gallbladder with the probe, in other words, as you push the probe into the patient right over their gallbladder, and the patient actually says to you, Yep, right there, Doc. That's the exact pain that brought me into your clinic, to your ER, uh, what have you. That is what's called this positive sonographic Murphy sign. It's very specific for having 
um, cholecystitis. The rest of the liver we can see abscesses in as well. This is a, a liver abscess. Kind of hard to see the kidneys over here for a second there. This is the, the liver seen here. This is all this hypochoic uh, encapsulated structure seen here as an abscess within this patient's uh, liver. Echinococcus or amoebic abscesses are somewhat common in our patients uh, at UCI, so we can see this as a distinct structure within the liver itself um, encapsulating itself there. Another example of that is seen here. This is this um, abscess seen here with various uh, regions to it or loculations, and this is normal liver tissue here. Again, liver abscess seen within this material. Try to put flow on it to see if it was actually some kind of vascular aneurysmal structure. It does not really light up with flow here. The flow is seen out here in the periphery in the liver. Sometimes we see some flash artifact when the patient's breathing in and out. Uh, but it's mostly the 2D or grayscale findings that confirm that this is an abscess. And finally, appendicitis. Um, one of the most challenging things you can do with an ultrasound probe, in my opinion, but also one of the most rewarding and important things that you can do with an ultrasound probe. Uh, the trick here is to uh, just be really good with ultrasound and develop these skills uh, over time and practice. The other trick is to time the uh, administration of uh, narcotic analgesia to the patient. So we typically use a very short-acting narcotic like fentanyl, lasts for about 20 minutes. We give the patient a good slug of uh, fentanyl, uh, one to two um, micrograms per kilogram. And um, it's a very potent uh, analgesic. And when given, works almost immediately and gives you a little window there in which to compress the abdomen. And so um, a normal appendix should not be more than six millimeters. We're compressing that uh, abdominal wall musculature all the way down to psoas. And uh, sometimes, as you'll see some of these examples, you can have an appendicolith. This is uh, appendicitis here. We see the psoas muscle down here, abdominal wall musculature here. And when we compress, that appendix gets wedged between psoas and abdominal wall musculature. This one is 9.7 millimeters. Greater than 6 millimeters, boom, appendicitis. Here's another example here of uh, appendicitis, compressing this abdominal wall musculature down to psoas, and we can see this appendix gets stuck in between there, eight millimeters here, in this example. Another example here, we're compressing uh, psoas muscle. Here's the appendix, here's abdominal wall musculature. We're compressing these two structures together, and the appendix gets wedged in between there, and this one is 9.8 millimeters. Another example here, compressing. As we fan through this appendix, uh, we may see what's a, something called a fecalith, or an appendicolith is another name for it. It uh, translated, it means poop stone. And basically that's the cause of appendicitis in many cases. Um, a very calcified uh, turd gets, um, blocks the opening of the appendix, and then the appendix can no longer drain its contents and starts to get enlarged and eventually the pressure within the lumen of the appendix exceeds the, um, the, the ability for blood supply to get to the, to the appendix, and um, you have ischemic necrosis of the appendiceal wall, and eventually um, you can get perforation where, in which the, that, um, that pus gets into the intraperitoneal space, and then you can have an abscess develop. And it has, uh, when that happens, perforation of the appendix, you have about an overall 5% uh, mortality rate in patients, which is why it's important to make the diagnosis before that happens. Now, 5% is, um, is really in older uh, patients who um, really are at risk for developing sepsis. It's much more tolerated in younger patients, actually. But um, we see here this um, appendicolith or fecalith. There's another example here of a of a person's appendix that's inflamed. Um, this is psoas muscle seen over here. The appendix is we're kind of moving it, uh, fanning through the appendix uh, as it goes um, lateral medially here. This is psoas, uh, abdominal wall musculature. Notice in all these cases we're using that linear transducer. Here is um, another one of those fecal lifts here. Um, looks just like a gallstone or a kidney stone, except it's in the appendix. And it's got that prominent shadowing there. 
uh, and that's the cause of our appendicitis. And if you were to use color flow Doppler, uh, you can actually see um, a hypervascularity around an inflamed appendix uh, to confirm um, if you wanted to that you're looking at an inflamed structure. Not necessary, but um, kind of elegant when you can see it like that. Okay, so to summarize, um, when we're looking for the source of the fever using ultrasound, we can start up at the, the head and neck region looking for lymphadenopathy. We can differentiate cellulitis from abscesses and help guide their drainage and avoid arterial structures. We can also, um, using the endocavitary transducer, uh, visualize a peritonsillar abscess and drain that under ultrasound guidance. And in patients who have a fever, neck pain, headache, we're worried about meningitis, especially if they didn't have their immunizations, then um, we need to perform a lumbar puncture. And you saw how to perform that under ultrasound guidance. Moving on uh, to the head, and, uh, I'm sorry, to the lung and the cardiac regions, we talked about the hepatitization uh, that we can see with the consolidation of pneumonia. And also uh, with endocarditis, you saw one uh, very Poor example of a, a vegetation um, seen on, on the mitral valve with endocarditis. We can also see um, infections um, causing fever in the extremities, um, all over the extremities from the joint spaces to uh, the soft tissue and uh, also um, in, the, in the tendon sheaths as well. And finally, we looked in the abdomen for the source of the fever and from this study, not surprisingly, uh, about half the patients, the source was found there. And we can see pyelonephritis, renal abscesses, cystitis, infections down in the, uh, the scrotal area with the epididymoorchitis, and in fact, uh, abscesses within the testicle and within the scrotum, uh, cholecystitis, uh, liver abscesses, and finally, appendicitis.